Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee and Clarks. I'm your co-host, JVM Brabham. I'm Tyler Duncan. And Tyler and I are going to be talking about a really cool topic, and that's going to be on how to pick schools or what students should consider when deciding on what they want to go and do school for. And that can be as an undergraduate, it can be as a master's student or a doctoral student. But before we get into our topic of the day, of course, we got to talk about the most important thing, at least for me, Tyler, is coffee. So Tyler, what are you drinking today? Yes, sir. So my parents came up for Thanksgiving and they brought a bag of beans from Bold Bean, which is a local roaster in Jacksonville. So I'm finishing up this bag called Sweet Spot, which is a blend. And normally I do single origin coffee, but my mom decided to spice it up. And I was like, sure, I haven't really uh, gone that route, but I think it's more of a light to medium type of blend as far as the roasting goes, which is right up my alley. Um, and they, they call it sweet spot, oddly enough. So that's uh, true players. So we always talk about the sweet spot. Um, but anyway, uh, so finishing that bag up, it's really good. And I'm drinking it in my 26.2, run 26.2 mug. So for mm-hmm. all the marathoners out there who know that distance. But anyway, what about you? Um, so if, if you know, our audience, if they follow our um, Instagram posts, you might have saw that I recently, finally, I know I've been talking about it for weeks, I finally got my Chemex. Um, so uh, I went out, when I, after I got my Chemex, I went out and, and brought some fresh beans because just that's just what you have to do, right? So um, we have a, a brewery, not brewery, but hey, that's a beer. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, <laughs> we have a cafe um, that roasts their own beans out in Thomasville, Georgia. So uh, I had to go to Thomasville. So I went to the um, the local coffee shop there um, and got a fresh bag of beans. It's called Georgia Blues and it's a medium roast and it has kind of like um, notes of chocolate and berries in it. So, you know, the past few days I've been brewing on my Kim X and it's great. It's definitely, the hype is real, I like to say. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think the best part about the brewing process is not only do you get like a fresh cup and a fresh taste of coffee, uh, it's also like the cleaning process is also a lot easier than say like a French press, right? You know, all you got to do is just take the coffee filters out and dump in the trash and you're pretty much good to go. Uh, and I'm also using the, the Chemex like paper filters um, that I brought from the same cafe shop. Uh, because apparently they don't sell those at grocery stores. So you kind of have to like order it online. But luckily when I went and got the beans, they had like a whole box, like a hundred uh, coffee filters. So I just went ahead and, and, and swiped that literally. Um, so it's been great. It tastes so, so good. It's really refreshing. Um, so that's my Georgia Blues um, nice. coffee. Um, out Real of quick. Thomas. Yes. Have you... Uh tried that bag on the french press you know what that's a great idea i'm gonna do that um tomorrow and i'll let you know you know uh, interesting thing is even though it's a it's a different um bag of beans i i did when i t- had the chemex for the first time i couldn't taste the difference between like the french press and like the french press a little bolder in taste like it's a little more like it hits you a little yeah, harder yeah yeah and the Kim is just a little more refined. Subtle. Yeah, yeah, a little more refined, a little more subtle. Um, so I think, yeah, that's definitely the biggest difference. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Sure. So if you want something that's going to hit you really early in the morning, maybe a French press is what you need that particular day. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And I imagine, depending on like what type of beans you get, that can also determine like what your brewing method should be, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure certain beans lends itself for French press or just even the grinding setting can lend itself more for like a French press um, than just like the pour over, the Chemex pour over. So, yeah. So that's our coffee talk for today. Good stuff yeah, all man. around. <laughs> cheers. Cheers to that. Cheers. Cheers, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so Tyler, as you know, all or most people, particularly like professional musicians, we all at some point um, attended music school, right? 
So when you were, if you can remember, I know this was a long time ago, when you were, you know, 17, 18, deciding on what colleges to go to, what are things that you were thinking about then? And knowing what you know now, what are things that you think are important for, you know, current 17, 18 year olds, seniors in high schools, or even juniors in high school should consider when choosing schools? Yeah, good question. So I think when I was in high school, I was a little bit too concerned about the name of the school or institution or conservatory. Because in my mind, it was like, well, if you want to be the best, you got to go to where the best are studying, which is true to an extent. Um, but I think I got super caught up in, well, if I'm not at this conservatory or any conservatory, really, then uh, I'm not going to be successful. And I don't know where that stemmed from. Maybe um, it was, you know, just something that you think about, like, as you're growing up and you're like, fangirling these musicians and you see where they went to school and you're like oh they went to this school in New York or wherever um, I think that kind of gets in your head and so for me um, it was it was interesting but but then everybody around me was like oh well there's a really good school music school in Tallahassee Florida State right that you could go to and um, and I also there are a couple people that I, I that were older than me that went there and from the same high school. And I knew that they were successful. And I knew one person, specifically Alfonso Horn, he was kind of like somebody that I really looked up to growing up. And I, I knew he did both sides of the playing spectrum. So he, he was a jazz musician and a classical musician, you know, and he majored in both of those. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. The school allows you to kind of go that path. Whereas some institutions either, you know, they don't provide a jazz degree or a classical degree, or it's, you know, it's, it's too uh, narrow of a, of a approach. So I was like, you know what, like, let's, let's do this. It's, it's in state. It's not far from home. Um, and I think at the, at the time where I was, I was still unsure about what it is I wanted to do, but I knew like generally I wanted to play music in some sort of capacity. And I felt like at the time, like this provided the best opportunity not really knowing much about the program itself, which is something that I would encourage students to do now. But I think for me, it was more so saying, okay, this is gonna allow me to get my feet wet at a bunch of different genres with great faculty members, great ensembles. Um, and, and of course it's a big music, music school, so you're gonna make a lot of connections too and, mm -hmm. and get that networking thing as well. And I was also into football, I was into sports. I was into that like, big school environment. Like I, I, I like that, that kind of hustle and bustle. It's almost like a little town within a town. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really like that a lot. And then the fact that the studio was competitive from the outside perspective, which we know being in it, it's, it's very competitive in a good way, a healthy competitiveness. Um, and I think that also drove me to, to apply. Um, but but, you know, thinking back now, I mean, there's so many things that I would I would do differently or I would have students research before applying to schools and also like the mindset difference. So let me ask the question to you as somebody that works with students that are in college, uh, both undergrad and master's. And you're also on the, the recruiting side, too. You speak to a lot of 17 and 18 year olds. So what are those what are those conversations look like and how do you talk to students you know, about where they want to go to school, mm -hmm. specifically right now, like high schoolers, like when you, whenever you have those conversations, like what are some of the things that you bring, bring up to them? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I've been, you know, recruiting college uh, for colleges at different, two different institutions the past, I guess, three years now. Um, and what I've come to find is most high school, the, va the vast majority of high school students, at least that I've encountered, don't know what they want or what to look for. So when I'm having, you know, my conversations with them about our program or, you know, what, you know, I, you know, hope them, uh, want them to accomplish or, you know, helping them figure out what they want to do in college. I think what I talk about is, um, um, uh, how can we best serve the things that they're interested in, even if they don't know what they want to do at that particular moment, but to kind of talk about what my programs are, we have these opportunities for you. 
And, you know, I always talk about myself as like a mentor. It's like my job is to help guide you through that program, whatever that looks like, whether that's, you know, you want to be a performance major, if you want to go into music education, if you want to do jazz, if you want to do whatever, you know, I kind of come um, to the discussion from that angle. It's like, all right, my job is to kind of guide you through that. And if you decide to come here, um, that's that's going to be my my goal, you know, I'm going to be your direct line to like getting through this program. And then once you graduate from this program, I'm still going to be like your first line of contact when you're looking for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, most high school students, they don't really know what to look for because, you know, I think at least my experience is very different because I was I was at a, an art school kind of like just like you. So the, the environment is very different. Right. Right. So. For the vast majority of high school students, they're, you know, at a, you know, just your your very typical high school program. So there's not a whole lot of um, guidance there, or at least not knowing what to really look for. And, and a lot of times they do know, like, the big name schools and all those things. But uh, um, most conversations, at least even when I talk to parents, they don't really know what the whole music feel, unless they are a musician or went to school you know, for music or something like that. They don't really know what to expect. So a lot of my conversation, even with parents is like, oh yeah, I remember actually, now that I mentioned that, um, I had a, a student who was visiting and like his mom, uh, we were talking, she said, so like, what can he do with a music degree, right? And I, and you know, and I think that's a complete fair question. Cause like, I think most people think, oh, a music career consists of being a banner because that's something they know they will probably work with their local band director at their kids high school so they can they see that they visualize that so they understand what that job entails so you know it's about like just kind of educating everybody on like all right these are the opportunities and you also have to be honest like certain degrees like a performance degree there aren't there's no guaranteed job at the end of the degree, right? But, you know, I, I tell my students, like, if they want to do performance, you know, the expectation is going to be really, really high. And my job in, you know, four years is to get you in a really, really good graduate program, right? Um, so that's usually how my conversations go with students and, and describing, like, all right, as a student here, you'll be expected to do these things. Your, your um, coursework would look like this. You know, we have these scholarship opportunities for you. We have these playing opportunities for you. Um, so we try to, um, or at least I try to recruit through that, that framework. Um, and then, you know, they'll have different questions, obviously. But what I've come to find is just like most students just don't know what to really look for, what to, what to consider outside of obviously they're all like wanting scholarship money as they should want scholarship money wherever they go. Yeah. So that's usually the 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 first thing that they're looking for scholarship, and then from there they don't really know um, what else is past that. At least the vast majority. Some of them are like they know exactly what they want. They know who they want to study with, et cetera, et cetera. What type of school they want to, and 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 some school and some students, at least that I've talked to, they do know if they want to go to like a big university or a small college, a lot of times they do have a, a, a feel of that, what they want in terms of like the size of the school. Um, but outside of that, um, not much, which kind of brings us to that our next kind of subject is like, what do you think are the benefits to going to a big school versus like a small school? Yeah, so I think well, one, with the small school, I think it's going to be a more intimate setting, right? Mm -hmm. So there's less students on campus. Um, it's probably going to be somewhat easier to make friends um, just because you're going to be seeing the same people all the time, mm -hmm. particularly in whatever major that you're, that you're studying. If it's in music, okay, it's a smaller music community. So you're going to be seeing people, networking with people, which is, which is great. You get to know people pretty quickly, whereas a bigger music school, you know, if there are thousands of students, then it's, it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, but mm -hmm. your network circle is going to be larger, right. right? So you get to mingle with more people. Um, I think it also depends to where the school's located. You know, like if you want to be in state or want to be out of state, that's something to consider based on what you feel most comfortable with. You know, 
family wise, or if you don't even care about that, you know, mm -hmm. if you're like, Hey, I'm cool with being a thousand miles away from my family, then, then by all means, you know, do that as well. Um, and then I would think about what that school has opportunity wise. I mean, you talked about playing opportunities, which I think come easier at first in a small school. I think that's one of those, I always think of related to like football programs. So it's like, all right, if you go to a big school, uh, you may not start until your junior or senior year. Now in a music program, that would be, well, you may not be in the top ensembles till your junior or senior year. You kind of have to wait your time, so to speak, until you can get into those positions, unless you come in and you're just burning, you know, mm -hmm. ready to go, which, which does happen from time to time. Um, whereas in a smaller school, you're going to be able to, you know, play in all the ensembles, get a lot of experience right away, which is good, but then also you know, kills your face pretty quickly too. Yeah. So maybe some of that time that you would set aside to practice, you're playing in a jazz ensemble or playing in some orchestra or something because you don't have enough trumpet players to kind of fill that role depending on the size of a studio. Um, and then the other thing too that comes with big school versus small school, well, not necessarily, but I guess it's the studio size, right? So that's something to consider too. Um, are you gonna come in and study with a grad assistant if they have grad assistants at a big school? Or are you going to be able to study with a professor right away? And for me, that was a big thing. It was like, well, if I'm going to go to school, I want to study with a professor. So like, I wanted to make sure that was a certain thing. And, and no offense to grad assistants or anything as you and I both were, but you know, for me, it was like, all right, I want to go to the school and I want to study with this person, you know? Um, and so sometimes that doesn't happen at a big school. You know, sometimes you might study, you know, half and half potentially just because there are so many students. Um, whereas like a small school, you know, you're going to be guaranteed a spot with a professor that's teaching there. Um, those things just come to mind. Is there anything else that you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Yeah, I, you know, I, I taught at a, a really small school and, you know, I think there were like maybe 1500 students on the entire campus. So really, really super, super like intimate liberal yeah. arts college. Uh, and, and I think the benefit, you know, you are kind of touched on this. One of the benefits is like when you're there, it's really like a family. It's a really small music department and you know everybody uh, as a professor. I knew not just all the, you know, the band kids. I knew the vast majority of the, the, the vocal students. I knew, you know, the um, the even like our guitar students. I knew basically everybody in the department. So through that, it does kind of create this wholesome like community of, of musicians, right? And as a freshman in those situations, you do get to play um, in a lot of ensembles. You kind of get thrown in the deep end day one, right? Um, but I, I do think like the downside to that um, is kind of like what you said again, it's like, you know, over the course of a semester, so it can be, um, too much playing for especially a young student who's still developing and I do think that can be a, a downside in their development because you know I've you you may experience this but when you're playing in a bunch of ensembles that means there's not as much time to practice or maybe you're too tired physically too tired to practice because you've been in like two or three rehearsals that day right and sometimes that can hinder progress over the long term and short term. Um, but on the flip side of that is that, you know, day one, you can play an orchestra, you can play in the top wind band, you can play in all these different like chamber um, ensembles, um, depending on what the school has to offer or the jazz ensemble, all these different ensembles you'll get to play in as much as you physically want to, or physically, in some cases, physically can play into. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and then I remember like when I was teaching at the um, that, that school, um, that was something I was mindful of uh, as, you know, a, a teacher there and, and director there. It's like, you know, I know obviously you want like your some of your strongest players playing first on everything. Um, but I, I, I tried to um, make sure that we were kind of spreading the wealth as much as possible. Um, so like everyone, or at least those two or three or four students are not just, you know, killing their face every day. Um, so that can be a downside. And I think if you're at least 
a teacher teaching at one of these small institutions, I think that's also something to be mindful, of, especially for like brass players, that you're not um, overworking your students because that's very easy to happen in like a music department, right? We do oh, sometimes yeah. get overworked. Um, and I say that as a, a, a professor now, it's like, I try to, I want to make sure my students are not being overworked. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you know, we're here to serve them, not the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but in, in terms of like large school, like you said, you know, when you're at a large institution, it creates more opportunities in terms of like networking. I think at least, you know, you and I both went to FSU, which is a really large, not just university, but the music school is, I believe, like the third largest in the country. So you're talking about roughly 1500 music majors in two buildings. And through that, I think that allows you, at least me, I remember my freshman year at FSU and hearing the trumpet players in our studio. And I was like, holy crap. Right. I need to like practice. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that gives you that inspiration to practice and to work harder. Um, yes, maybe you don't get all those um, performance opportunities right away, but being in that environment, the studio, the culture, seeing a, just the highest level of, of musicianship will and, and even if you're not even trying to it's going to make you be better it's going to force you to become a better musician or a better trumpet player or, or what whatever you're striving to do so i think that is truly one of the biggest benefits of being at a, a large institution um and then you know the downside of that is maybe you don't get a chance to study with the professor maybe not initially maybe eventually do or you may study with a grad student or um, like I said earlier, you may not play in the top ensemble your first or second semester at the school. Maybe it might take a while, um, depending on the situation. Um, but, you know, I, I think if you're looking for schools, that just kind of has to be one of those things you weigh. Like, what do you value and what type of opportunities that you want? And unfortunately, you know, as a 17 or 18 year old, you may not know the answer to that. Um, I mean, for me personally, uh, like I said earlier, I went to a um, an art school, a residential high school. So it was like a boarding school for the arts. So, you know, we stayed on campus and that school kind of has a um, conservatory type um, feel to it environment. It's kind of modeled af after the, the conservatory model. Um, so like being at that school, um, like you were saying earlier, I definitely got like kind of caught up in the lights and, and looking for these big name schools and, and, and all these different things. Cause I just thought that's what you were supposed to do. That's what would, many of my friends were doing. Many of my teachers at the school all went to big conservatories and they were kind of like, Hey, you need to look at this school. You need to look at this school. And so for me, it was like, Oh, I'm supposed to do this, um, go to one of these major conservatories. But at the end of the day, um, I had to have like a, basically a conversation with myself because I was like, I want to get a, a music education degree. So that eliminates a lot of programs, right? Um, and like, I, I'm from a small town. I went to a small school. And then when I went to this, this art school, it was even smaller, maybe like, maybe a little less than 200 students. So I was like, I want to go to a big university <laughs> to get out of just this small town, big, you know, small music school. Um, vibe. So again, that eliminated a lot of more, a lot more schools. And then I said, I want to go to a big university with a really good music program. So that really, there was only a handful of schools, at least at that time that I thought kind of fit those things that I was looking for. And then my, my trumpet teacher in high school was like, oh yeah, you should check out this program, you know? And one of those programs was FSU. So I went down audition. And once I got there, it's like, all right, this is exactly, it kind of checks all the things. Big university, um, really good music program. I got a chance to talk to the trumpet professor, Chris Moore. Um, we talked for maybe like 30, 40 minutes after my audition. Um, and it was a really good time. I had some friends who were going there that I went to high school with. So that also helped. Um, and, you know, I got the out of state fee waiver and all that, all those scholarship opportunities. So that was like, all right, this is where I need to go. And, it, and it obviously it worked out and I enjoyed my time there. Um, but, you know, I think 
if I allow the environment that I was in um, at this particular school, maybe I would have made the wrong decision for the wrong reasons, right? Um, so I think, you know, any high school student um, who's looking at schools, you got to kind of ask, like, all right, what type of environment do you want to be in, you know? And then kind of go from there, kind of make a checklist of things that you value and see which schools match up to those things that are on your checklist and, and kind yeah. of go from there. Absolutely. And not every university is going to check all the boxes, yeah, but some absolutely. are going to come, some are going to come really, really close. And I think that's important. And I think another thing too is visit the schools, yes. <laughs> you know, like visit the schools, visit the studio, have a lesson with a professor, like understand what you're going to get get into like mm -hmm. being able to be in that environment like we're talking about the only way to do that is to actually go there yeah you know, actually know you know what the professor's about go and sit in a studio class see what the other people are like in the studio are they nice are they judgy are they are they cool to hang out with like that's another thing too because those are going to be your colleagues for the next four years yeah and uh you know if everybody's giving you the cold shoulder it's like yeah i don't know if you want to go there you right know, so that's that's super important just to piggyback off of the environment thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I went back to FSU for my doctorate, one of my um, colleagues who's in, going through the program with me, um, sweet, sweet, um, sweet person, uh, we kind of joke around at least uh, more used to kind of like tease her because um, when she was applying for doctoral programs, she visited FSU like four or five times before her audition. Cause she wanted to make sure like this is where she wanted to be she wanted to check out all these different things she was also married and so she wanted to make sure like it would be a good place for her husband because he was looking for for schools as well um so like she did all this you know her due diligence and she would you know get lessons she didn't uh you know go to classes talk to people in the studio and get you know all these different things you know and you know she was living out in the midwest so you know flying back and forth or i'm, I'm assuming she flew and didn't drive that distance <laughs> uh, can be really expensive and but you know she wanted to make sure you know especially for that degree be, being a doctoral student it's like it's really really important and like like i said like she visited at least four or five times you know, and then do, and then did the auditions like, all right, this is kind of like the vibe I'm looking for. And, um, and I'm assuming I can't speak for her, but I'm assuming she uh, didn't regret her decision. Um, but yeah, so visiting the school is so important because you want to know what you're walking into day one. And as I say to my students, like day one of the semester, I'm just like, you know, in our first studio class, I'm like, look around especially i especially say this to the freshmen who are there I'm say hey, look around to the people in this room this is your family these people in this room are going to help you succeed through this program and even after you graduate from this program you know so you need to reach out to these people in this room you know this is a family this is what this all is about so you you need to make sure you're walking to an environment that values that like 100 yeah. <laughs> percent. yeah absolutely so quickly, or I guess not quickly, but now if you're going to go from undergrad to a graduate to, uh, graduate program, how does that differ? Does it differ at all? Um, and, and in your experience, like what were some things that you looked for that were maybe different than when you were applying for undergrad schools? Yeah, I think there's some like subtle differences between, you know, looking for undergraduate program versus looking for a master's or, or doctoral program. I think what graduate work is the, the everything is a little more specific. It's a little more focused, right? Like if you're going into a graduate, a master's program so for like say performance, you know, okay, so these next two years, I need to be focused on this one thing, you know, which is like getting better, becoming a more refined player, you know, getting professional opportunities, hopefully getting maybe some uh, teaching experience if you're able to get like a, a TA spot or a GA spot. All these different things really, really matter in terms of like what you want to do after graduate school. Um, because now once you're in graduate school, it's time to start really truly building up your 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 CV, right? And, and I want to add that master's degree goes by Yes. It goes by, yeah, I, I have my uh, my grad students here and I'm just like, our first lesson of the semester, I'm just like, okay, 
we have a lot of work to do because this degree is going to go by like, you know, like that in a snap. It's so and, true. Yeah, it really does. And I was actually talking to them um, yesterday, actually. And I was like, hey, your first semester is over. We only have three more of these, yeah. <laughs> you know? And he's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. So when you're applying for a graduate program, I think the first and the, the primary objective needs to be like linking up with a great teacher who's going to, you know, be your, your lifeline to future professional opportunities, right? Who's going to help guide you through the program. This is both as a master and especially as a doctoral student. Um, so when I was looking for graduate programs, um, uh, I was looking at places that I can have different opportunities in terms of, I want to go somewhere where I can get a GA, um, where I can get some like true, like professional teaching experience. I want to, which also helps with the financial burden, burden of going to graduate school. You know, if you get oh, a GA, yeah. it's like, for the most part, depending on the institution, it covers your tuition and you get a stipend, a monthly stipend or so, or however it's designed at that institution. And then, so that was a, a big objective, get a GA so I can get some actual like true um, work experience in a collegiate, uh, collegiate environment. And then like, obviously the teacher, you know, I want to go somewhere where that teacher is going to be really invested in me and who's going to like, you know, kick my butt weekly in our lessons who's going to be supportive and, you know, feel like, you know, they have my back, not just like as a student, but like once I leave and graduate. Um, and then the other part, you know, I guess the third plate, the third objective was like um, being in a, again, being in a studio that's supportive, that has a, a really good environment, you know? And, um, and the last thing I wanted to be in a, a city where I can also get some um, professional experience outside of just, you know, being a student at an institution. Um, so I, you know, I ended up, as you know, at New Mexico, which is in Albuquerque. So while I was there, you know, I was a GA. So I, I kind of checked that off. And I was with, you know, I was very, very lucky. I had two trumpet teachers there, Jeff Piper and, and, and Dr. John Marciano. So I was getting like two lessons a week from two great trumpet professors. And, you know, I was obviously playing in all the ensembles, orchestra, the wind symphony. And, you know, I think luckily when I was there, I was around, I was in the studio when we had like seven or eight other grad students. So, which is a lot um, for really any school, especially one of that size. Um, and so I had really good colleagues and, you know, who became my, you know, really, really good friends while I was there and who were all very, very talented trumpet players. And um, through that, you know, it forced me to become a better player, you know? when your colleagues are like killing it in, in studio class or in their recitals, it's like, all right, I need to practice. Not that you really need that motivation like that, but it's like, it just makes you want to elevate your own um, abilities. So, and then, you know, living in Albuquerque, I got to play in the New Mexico field and play in Santa Fe and, and, and do all this other like professional playing and gigging outside of school, which is something I also wanted. Um, playing some concertos with some local orchestras. So it kind of like hit all these things that I was looking for in a graduate program. And, you know, I still, you know, talk to my, my teacher from there and I'm still in contact with many of my friends in New Mexico. So it was a really good time. So that's kind of like what I was looking for as a graduate student. Um, again, you know, I think the conversation of like, should I go to a, a, a big conservatory after coming out of, you know, FSU, that was something that was on my mind, kind of like when I was in high school. But again, I just made a list of things I value and see which schools align with that. And it just so happened to work out that New Mexico kind of hit all those checkpoints for me. What about you? Yeah. Yeah, I think you, uh, well, well said, but I think you also got to think about uh, what it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's going to really dictate where yes. you go. So if you want to go get your master's somewhere, but you really just want to freelance and teach and kind of build that kind of business for yourself, then I think going to maybe a bigger city, like somewhere like somewhere in Texas, for instance, I mean, where you can teach students all day, literally, yeah, until you don't want to, um, or getting into a city where there's orchestra work, there's big band work. I mean, there's just tons of different opportunities, playing opportunities. I think 
that can kind of gear you or help make the decision. Though, if you are on the other side of that and are like, ah, freelance isn't really the thing that I want to do after I'm done with school, I want to take auditions or I want to go the collegiate route of, of teaching, then of course, then at that point, the city doesn't matter as much, right. I don't think. Because I think every city is going to have some sort of playing opportunity. Um, it's just a matter of depending on what it is you want to do. And for me personally, I I was kind of transitioning out of freelancing. I've done that for five years and I kind of reached the point where I was like, all right, this is kind of, I was in Atlanta. So I was in a big city and I was like, all right, I've kind of reached the point where like, I know what I'm going to get and this is about it. And I wanted something more. And I was thinking about military bands because we, you and I both have friends that are in them or we know people that uh, from school that are in those ensembles. And I was like, you know, they seem like really good opportunities, super competitive, like great musicians. And then also the, they take care of you as well from the financial side. And so at the time I was like, okay, well, who are winning these auditions? Like what programs, what schools? And one of them happened to be Florida State. And it just was at that time where you and I, I remember you and I were talking and, you know, Dr. Moore had some assistantships open and at that point, it was kind of a no brainer. I was yeah. like, all right, well, it's going to be free. It. Yeah, basically <laughs> free. And he's on board with what the mission and what the goal is, mm -hmm. you know, to, to gain employment, to win an audition, but then also to gain that experience of teaching. You know what the studio is like, you feel comfortable. It's almost like coming back home. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a no brainer at that point. And so for me, that was the only school I applied to for my master's. And, um, you know, it's Oh, yeah. I don't know. Some people are high risk, high risk, but high reward at the same time. Yeah. So, um, and it just happened to work out. And I think that's, that's something that you really need to think about is what it is you want to do and who are the people that are getting into those positions and where are they coming from? What's their background? Who are they studying with? Um, Cause you, you'll see trends and mm -hmm. these trends will, will change from time to time, you know, in the seventies, eighties, nineties, in all those decades, people were winning jobs from different programs and different schools. And right now we're kind of seeing a certain trend happening. And, and so I think it's really responsible of the person to take note of, okay, who's actually winning jobs from these schools? Who's actually getting placed in the college teaching jobs? Where are they going? Okay, they're going to this school, this school, this school. I wonder why, what, what's going on that are allowing these people to be successful? And it's no mistake, you know, there, there's a reason behind all of that. So I think that for me, that was kind of the process thinking of this is what I wanted to do. What program, again, have the program work for you? You know, what program is going to set me up for success and allow me to get where I want to go? Um, and yeah, it just ended, you know, working out. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah. clearly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, yeah. I think that's really important knowing like what your end goal is, right? You yeah. know, for me, I knew at a, a very young age that so I want to be a college professor. I was weird like that. So like everything I did was like, hey, man, you had the vision early. <laughs> I wish I had that. No, I, well, I, I guess so. Uh, I mean, there's, I guess, been some benefit to that and some frustration along the way. But uh, yeah, I since I knew that, I think that's why as an undergraduate, I, I went into music education because I want to be a good teacher and um, also give myself more, you know, employment possibilities. Um, and so like when I was looking for graduate programs, if I knew that was my end goal, I wanted to make sure I set myself up to get more employment opportunities down the road, which is kind of how the New Mexico thing worked out and me, you know, ending up back at FSU because that was always goal one for me. Um, so for me, like the conserv being at a, like a conservatory wouldn't necessarily like fill that um, that void, you know. Um, so it, knowing what you want to do and, and how those institutions are going to um, support that or guide you to that vision or that dream or goal that you have, it's really, really important. Um, so for you, was, you know, I eventually I want to do maybe some military bands. All right. Which schools are, you know, winning jobs or which players from what studios are winning those jobs. And um, clearly, you know, it worked out going to FSU. And, you know, as you, you and I both know, they 
have a lot of students out of that studio have one military job. So I think knowing, you know, who's winning jobs, what studio, what studio, you know, at least for what I want to do, if I want to be a college professor, all right, who's pumping out these great college professor, or at least like which studios like um, students are winning jobs for, you know, collegiate teaching jobs. Um, or who's winning the military band job, or who's winning the orchestra jobs? Like, what school is pumping out the big orchestral players, and right. and and trying to figure out, all right, can I go there? It, and are they have any openings? You know, what the audition process is like, and to me, that is the next step in in all of that, knowing what you want and finding an institution that meets align with that vision. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And then also too, for me, it was the cost. It was how yes. much money am I willing to spend to get go through this process and not know what's going to be on the other side you know yes. and when you tack on the, the graduate assistantship where tuition's waived you only have to pay fees i was like well this is a no-brainer like yeah. that's that's easy and you get teaching experience and you know at least i can only speak for florida state but it's like you have definitely more interaction with the faculty members and so it's now it's you're corresponding with them sending emails to them about certain things you're able to play in a few maybe chamber ensembles with the faculty members and it's like oh wow like they're starting to become even though they are faculty and um you know you're not peers so to speak or colleagues but you're you're kind of like right under there they you know they kind of look at you as uh a developing almost a professional out in the mm -hmm. real world you know so it's a really cool relationship that's built during those years that's a little bit different than than the undergrad years i would say yeah and you know again, everybody's situation is completely different. And, um, you know, and that's why I think you have to take it, our, our stuff with a grain of salt. And that's why, like what you said was perfect, make a list, figure out what it is you want, and then see what schools check those boxes. Because if it's a conservatory, then go for it. Yeah, then do it. If that's going to allow you to be the most successful, then go for it. Do yeah, it. If it's a small school, somewhere that nobody knows of, cool, do it. If it's a big school and a big town, like awesome, like whatever works for you. And I think that's kind of the big picture is like as much input as you can from other people is great. But at the end of the day, you're the one making the decision and you have to be confident with that. But also too, on the flip side, if it doesn't work out, you can always leave and go somewhere else. Like, yes. and, and the same thing too, like some people think, well, I want to perform. Why am I getting a music ed degree? Or, or it's like, I want to get a music ed degree, but I want to perform at some point. And it's like, that's okay. Like clearly like in your situation, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, it doesn't really matter as much in my opinion, it doesn't really matter as much what the degree in the degree is in it's, it's what you do during that time. Yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, it's like getting a music ed degree really just like broadens your horizon, mm -hmm. you know, and allows you to have a little bit more diversity and gives you time to figure out like if this is what you do because if you're in performance and then you get out of that degree and you're like this isn't what i want to do and you're like yeah okay well there goes four years of your life <laughs> you know so to speak but i think nothing is set in stone i think we it's a big kind of burden that 17 and 18 year olds have is all right i'm going to choose this school and pick this major right away and i think about how many people go to college and they're undecided when they come yeah. in you know, which is perfectly yeah. fine. And for yeah. us, we feel like you have to know exactly what you want to do. Yeah. What institution. Yeah. yeah. And I think, unfortunately, like the music school as an institution, not just, you know, in a particular school, but just as a whole, it's like, I think sometimes it's a disadvantage that, you know, if you declare as a music major, like day one, you're a music major and you're starting like core work versus like a lot of other majors, you don't start your core work until like, two years down the line till you come like a junior and then you're kind of getting in like the meat of your major um so there that that's I think there is some disadvantage in in that because you're kind of like forcing 17 18 year olds to make these major decisions about their life when they may not be ready to do that which kind of plays into like what you're saying it's like you know you can always either transfer or change your major obviously if it if you find out like this is not what you want and that's okay. Like, you know, I've had students who's like, who have come in as a music major and, you know, after their first semester, so, you know, I enjoy music, but 
it's not something like I want to really work at. I want to have it like as a hobby or something I do for fun versus like dedicating my life to like really practicing and digging in. And I'm like, that's okay, you know? And it's good that you figure that out now versus like four years from now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we we always have that option. And, and, and kind of like what you were saying earlier about like, you know, you may decide to be a music education major and you want to, you know, perform. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. You know, I was a music ed major. I got plenty of performance opportunities and, you know, I was practicing just as much as the performance majors and playing in ensembles with all the performance majors and all doing all these other things outside like competitions and et cetera, et cetera, um, as a music education major. And I never felt like music education like hindered me from opportunities. I thought being a music education major, if anything, helped enhance many of my opportunities because I was able to do a lot of different things. And once I graduate, I feel like I had more options um, to go in and do more things because I had that background um, as a teacher. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's you know, because at the end of the day, as you and I both know, because it doesn't matter what really degree, I mean, if you want to do, if you want to be a player and, and want to do more performance, it ultimately comes down to like, do you sound good? And no one cares I mean, what degree you have. I, I was, a, came in as both a jazz and classical major at Florida State. And then by the end of my degree, I was just a BA in music. And because I didn't like being pigeonholed into, oh, you just have to study this music or you have to take those classes. And I was like, I want to take other courses. I want to be able to do kind of both. I want to be able to uh, take some business classes, take some leadership classes, management classes, which I was able to do with the, the BA in music, which served me when I went to freelance because I was better suited to talk a little bit more business than I would if I was just mm -hmm. taking counterpoint or something like that. No offense to counterpoint lovers, <laughs> but you know, I mean like that counterpoint isn't going to help you uh, negotiate uh, a contract or talk to people about, um, how to get paid or, you know, anything of that nature or networking. So, um, yeah, I, I knew like I wanted to freelance right out of college. And so like for me personally, the BA route was the best thing I could do, you know? So yeah, like you said, it's not, it's not really the, uh, the name of the degree on the, the paper that you get. It's, it's kind of what you do with it that matters. So, yeah. And yeah. again, and I, and I would say that the same thing about the institution as well, like find your bliss, find where you're going to be happy. And ultimately, you know, regardless if you go to a super small school or a very large university or a conservatory, at the end of the day, you know, it's kind of up to you to figure out how to get to your program. And that's going to really determine your own success. Um, I mean, like I, I said earlier, I, I've taught at a a super, super small school. And some of the students there were super talented and they're gonna be great once they, you know, they finish and go on to do great things, you know? And in and, and some regards, I was like really amazed by like the talent level of some of these students. Cause you would think, oh, it's a small school, you know, the talent level is not there. Um, and it's just not the case, you know? So, and they, all those students chose that school cause they wanted to be in that kind of environment. And I yeah. applaud them for making that decision when they were 17 or 18 years old. And it and it worked out for them. They were being very successful and, and getting all these opportunities to play super, super early in their, their college um, career. Um, so yeah, and it's it's really important. Um, but I know, I, I and that one thing I would add, I know we didn't talk much about it is, you know, when you're applying for a doctoral program, I, I also think that, you know, kind of like with the master's degree, it's, it's super, super important to make sure, kind of like we were saying earlier, having your checklist of things that you value, um, that you're picking uh, an institution where you and the teacher have like a super uh, close relationship, right? Um, I know you, you have a lot of friends who've gone through doctoral programs what what do you think I know you, you you didn't go that route but like what do you yeah. think are you know if you have somebody who's asking about doctoral programs um you've been around the block so if you have someone who's yeah. asking about it, like what what would you recommend so one thing or a couple of things I guess is first just know that this is this is it this is your terminal degree so there is no more like oh well this doesn't work out I'll go 
and get that degree after this or whatever. Like, this is it. This is yeah. done. And I think music majors particularly fall in that trap of, oh, I'll just get my undergrad. Oh, I'll get my master's. Oh, I'll get my doctorate. Then I'll figure it out. Yeah. And it's like, mm, no, one, that's a lot of money. Two, that's a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so I think having that mindset of some urgency, I think you can lose urgency transitioning from undergrad to master's. I think it hits you towards the end of your master's for some people where they're like, oh, crap. My playing's gotten better, but it's not good enough to maybe want a job right now. What do I do? And so they're like, well, I guess I'll get my doctorate. That's what yeah. everybody else does, right? And then they get their doctor and they're like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So sense of urgency there. I think the other thing too is like you said, what is it you want to do? Like figure that out. And then also, yeah, you talked about this and I like using that analogy of the uh, lifeline, like the professor that's that matters mm -hmm. a ton. I mean, this person's going to be writing recommendation letters. This person's going to be on the phone with you when the committee calls and says, can you talk about this person's character? Can you talk about their, you know, their discipline? How do they get along with others? I think that's so important. And if you have a professor that is in and out or only at the school for a couple of weeks at a time or one or two times a month, like whatever it is, like it's super hard to develop consistency in a relationship with that person. Whereas if you have somebody that's there day in, day out, knows your struggles, knows what you're working on, knows, you know, personal things to an extent, you know, what you're willing to share and all that, that helps build that relationship for them to better understand you and who you are as a person. Um, I don't know. That's just so beneficial. I mean, I was even talking to Dr. Moore yesterday, asking him some questions with my injury situation and you know, it's like, he's somebody that I can go to and, and seek advice and, and have comfort in just because I know like we've built that relationship and he truly does care about the student, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say, you know, at this point, yeah, figure out what institution is going to set you up. If it is college teaching, you know, what opportunities does that school provide? Are they going to allow you to maybe get some certifications or maybe like some emphasis in like theory or music history or something else that'll make you more marketable? That's awesome. Uh, do they have a graduate assistantship? I think that's super important, particularly if you want to teach. I mean, what better way to get teaching experience than teaching undergrad music majors, you know, like, yeah, that's an awesome thing to think about. So yeah, I mean, some of the things that we talked about, but I think it's more emphasized on the urgency of figuring out the, the path that you want to go down and then also how important it is to you know really have a professor that's invested in the university you know uh, that isn't going to leave in the next year or halfway through your program you know that's something to full disclosure talk about you know like mm -hmm. are you going to be here committed for the next three years of my time because i'm coming to study with you exactly. you know and then what the opportunities are um, outside of just your degree program are there other opportunities to kind of beef up your CV and your experience. You kind of nailed it. Man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm around all you guys, you know, talking to uh, people that have gone through the program. And so you, you listen, you know, you listen yeah. to what people talk about and um, it's not rocket science, but I think you have to be around it enough to understand. Like it isn't just some magical thing, like how people get to where they are. It's like, it's, it's methodical. They do their yeah. research. They learn. Like if you're going to invest in a company, like I'm looking right now, Airbnb is about to go public, mm -hmm. right? Or I think they're going public today. Um, this is the 10th of December, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you need to research that company before you're going to invest in them. It's the same thing. Like whatever mm -hmm. school you're going to do your research because you're about to invest in that program, you know? Yeah. And you know, it's funny you mentioned something uh i have a little story to share um you you know this story um but uh like, like you said like the teacher especially for a doctoral student is it's going to be your lifeline and like you said they're going to be talking to the committees they're going to be helping you guide you through your your coursework and your dissertation and and all the other wow. things that come with being a, a, a doctoral student uh Go ahead, go ahead. What, yeah, did you have? one more thing. Make sure they know how to write too, right? Because yes. like you're going to have to do that in your doctorate. Yes. So make they sure have no they, experience. They, <laughs> yes, make sure they, they know that process. That's really, really important. Yes. <laughs> it's really, that really important. That sometimes gets missed. Sometimes yes. schools bring in these big names, which is great, but they never been through a doctorate program yeah, or even exactly. a master's. Like, so they have no idea how to get something published. Exactly, you know, like, exactly. So those are really important. And it's funny enough, 
Um, so when I was applying for jobs after I graduated from my doctorate program, it's funny, um, my, my, I know my a job that I was applying for, they were calling people on my um, uh, reference list. And it's funny because my teacher apparently was talking to them and Tyler, you, I think you just so happened to be like getting a ride with more one time as they're like calling him or he was talking to them on the phone. And so it's like really, really funny. Um, when you told me about this, like he was talking to the phone, he's like, shh, be quiet. Well, I'm on the phone with my reference or with my, the committee, the hiring committee that was talking to him on my behalf. So, so it's, it's things like that, that's going to really determine how successful you are going to be, you know, after you graduate. And like you said, you, you want to be with somebody who knows about getting things published, you know, who's, um, you know, I think it's, I mean, I guess you can have a situation where maybe they didn't go through a doctor program, but they understand maybe they've done it enough to know how to guide students through that. But that is something you need to definitely consider. You know, I think if I had never gone through a doctoral program and I was having doctoral students, that would be a challenge because it's like, I, I'm not sure what to tell you because I, I haven't done it myself. Um, so that, I think that is something to make a note of. And you, and you want somebody who's going to be uh, uh, someone who's going to be a really good colleague in a sense, even though there's still this student to teacher relationship. But on that level, when you're a doctoral student, there is still this um, working uh, working relationship with the, the professor, because especially if you're a TA and you're, you're teaching students in, within the studio, there's just this like professional relationship that you have with your your um, your professor that's I think really really important. Um, so yeah, those are all really important things, and I, I think you know one of the benefits of having my teacher as a doctoral student was like he was always pushing us to do you know publications, get you know get your stuff published, you know be presenting at conferences. You need to be with these organizations. You need to be doing all this professional development outside of just being a student because that's what this degree is about. You know, you want to yeah. and it is you want to make sure your your teacher is, you know, a place a high value on marketability because as a doctoral student, once you're graduating, you're I'm assuming you're in a doctoral program to be a college teacher. Um at least that's I think why someone should enter a doctoral program. Um, but, you know, if you're in that situation, then it's really about making yourself as marketable as possible. And, and I think it's really important to have somebody who understands that is going to help guide you and give you that advice and be the mentor that one needs when you're going through a degree as stressful as a doctoral, <laughs> a doctoral yeah. degree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I agree, man. I agree. Well, hopefully this was helpful for uh, listeners out there. Um, this is stuff that I wish I would have known when I was 17, 18. And then luckily, thankfully, I had some older friends like yourself, JV, and that kind of guided me to make important decisions in my life, you know, because whenever you make these decisions, typically you're, you know, moving and traveling and, and you know, really putting your roots down somewhere else. And so that's a big decision to make and not to make lightly. And so, you know, I was thankful to have people in my life that kind of guided me and provided advice. So um, it's important, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have questions yeah. or need advice on it. I mean, it's not, it's not an easy thing. It's like we talked about today, there's lots of layers to it. Um, so this is kind of hopefully informative and, and helpful. So speaking of which, Javian, um, what kind of music have you been checking out? Are you into the holiday music yet? Or is that a... <laughs> I mean, it's December 10th, but man, it's like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny that you say that. I don't think I listen to any holiday yeah. or Christmas music yet. I don't know why, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those weird people. Like I, I see all these like holiday movies on like Netflix or yeah. on, on, on cable. And I was like, I want no part of it. <laughs> I don't know. I just I, never I, enjoyed. That's just me. Um, I've just never enjoyed like holiday movies. Um, in terms of like holiday music, um, I haven't really listened to other than maybe like 
just walking around town or it might ha- so happen to be on a radio when I'm in the car. Um, but yeah. I'm not like actively listening to holiday music. I think maybe just cause you know, we end up playing it so much. If granted, maybe not this year cause of COVID yeah. there's not many gigs, <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't been listening to much holiday music. Um, uh, however, I have been listening to, um, uh, at least this week, uh, I was listening to one of the my favorite albums of all time um, by Lauren Hill, Miss it Uneducated. Uh, I think that's like, to me, it's in my top three of albums, like period. Like that album to me is just so well crafted. Obviously it won like six or seven Grammys. Um, well respected album. I just love Lauren Hill's music. Um, and on the newer side, uh, I'm listening to this this rapper out of uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Her name is uh, Chica. Um, she's kind of like this up and coming rapper. Granted, you know, I think she's got nominated for her first Grammy. So she's definitely blowing up. Uh, if you, you know, people get a chance, check out her um, NPR Tiny Desk concert on, on YouTube. Uh, it's, it's great. It's, it's really, really, really good music, at least in my opinion. Uh, what about you? What have you been listening to? You've been listening to holiday music? No, I, I haven't. It's it's been a weird year, man. There's just so many other distractions and things going on. True. Um, so I, I haven't yet. Maybe it's because I've been cooped up in the same place since March. So it's like, but we did have a little bit of some flurries yesterday on my oh, run. Nice, uh, yeah, I was like, nice. oh, this is cool. Uh, so no, I, I haven't really been. Um, but I've been listening to Tori Kelly. She's been on Spotify just haven't no particular albums they'll just play like random songs on there and so some of it's her original some of it's her doing covers with people or being like a a a side man or side woman i guess to uh other singers which is cool and then hall and oats uh just been listening to them i first heard about them when i was playing for uh, wedding bands and i was like oh this is hip what is this and i was like oh this is some old school stuff here (laughs) so yeah i've just been checking them out and um yeah having some diversity in the music and it's it's nice and refreshing so but um uh, anyway so we hope you guys have enjoyed this episode uh Javian, where can people find you and coffee and clarks for that yeah yeah you can um follow me on uh, instagram at nerdy prof that's just with one f and on facebook just Javian brabham you can find me there um yeah, I think that's it. What about you, uh, Tyler? Yeah, so you can find me on Facebook, Tyler Duncan, for now. Uh, we'll see. I see Facebook is under a bunch of... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah that's, right. <laughs> but that's another episode. Uh, and, then, and then Instagram, Tyler Duncan 91 You can also find Coffee and Clarks on Instagram at Coffee and Clarks and Facebook at Coffee and Clarks. We are also on YouTube please subscribe, please view, please share. And if you like it, give us a thumbs up. If not, then just don't do anything. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) You can also find us on Apple Podcasts. If you like it, give us a rating. If not, don't do anything. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we'll be putting out some more content. I think we're thinking about uh, our next episode being kind of goal setting. I mean, how appropriate with the new year, Mm -hmm. right? Goal setting, but not the typical, uh, you know, goal setting that you think of this is going to be a little bit more refined a little bit more practical we don't want a uh, big lofty goals and then a month in you get frustrated yeah, exactly that's typical like the resolution type thing we're, mm-hmm. we're not doing that we're talking about lifestyle and like things that you can actually build upon so stay tuned for that i think we're going to try to get that out in the next few weeks but um yeah this was fun man i it's appreciate fun. your time no yeah problem. this is good good yeah, Well, thank you all for listening in and we'll have new episodes out hopefully soon. Um, So leave us some comments in the YouTube page. If you want or you have questions, you just send us some messages and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All right. Thank you all for listening. See you next time.